<clears throat> this morning, we're now moving into uh, John chapter 10, a very familiar passage that portrays our Lord Jesus Christ to us in many different ways, but particularly as a door through which we enter into a relationship with God, into the kingdom of heaven, and also as the, the good shepherd, the one who goes before his sheep, the one who protects his sheep, the one who lays down his life for the sheep. Let's um, break open this chapter by reading the first 21 verses, and we are actually going to look at these verses, but don't let that daunt you in any way, because really um, there aren't that many main points in here, but the ones that are here are very important. Now, this is what our Lord Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee for him, from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, and the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me even as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. A division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? May the Lord bless his word again to us this morning. Now remember Jesus said earlier in this gospel, in John's gospel, that he didn't come into the world to judge the world, but he came to save it. As we saw last time, he came so that those who can't see might be made to see. Now if you see this morning, if, if your blindness that you had by nature as you came into the world has been healed, if you see the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ and so have trusted in Him to save you, it's because Jesus came to save you. He came to open the eyes of the blind. He came to open your eyes. At the same time, Jesus also made it clear that He did come to judge. He came to judge those who thought that they could see just fine without Him. The religious leaders, the hypocrites, those who didn't need him, those who thought God would accept them the way they were, that they were good enough. 
Now, the fact that they saw themselves in this way showed that they were blind. Blind to the very thing that would ultimately destroy them, blind to their sin. Now, again, our Lord warns you this morning not to fall into the same trap of thinking that you are good enough without Jesus, that you can get into heaven without Him. Because if that's what you think, you're still blind. And unless the Lord opens your eyes, you will perish. Now, don't let that happen to you. Come to Jesus. Jesus said He came to open the eyes of the blind, and He will open yours if you are willing to come to Him. Remember our Lord Jesus says that everyone who comes to Him, He will not cast out, but He will receive them. Now, far from thinking themselves to be blind, we understand the Pharisees saw themselves in an entirely different light. They saw themselves as the ones who were enlightened, the ones who had God's truth, the ones who were the teachers of Israel, ultimately, who had the keys to the door of God's kingdom. And I think in some senses, they saw themselves as the door into the kingdom, and certainly as the shepherds of God's people. Now, it is to this conceited idea that our Lord Jesus now addresses the parable of the Good Shepherd. Now really he has several things in view as he talks about this. He has in view his rebuke and indictment of the leaders of Israel, but at the same time he also wants to comfort those who are his sheep. Now Jesus begins by telling them this parable. Let me simply read it again in verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying. Now, they didn't understand it because, re remember again, a parable is meant in some senses to be a judgment against the leaders of Israel. It was meant to hide certain things from them, at least it was unless that parable happened to be directed against them. Now, in this case, it is, and so Jesus explains it, so that they will know where they have gone wrong. Now, again, when our Lord does this, it is an act of judgment, yes, but remember, Jesus still is showing mercy. He's trying to point out their errors so that they might repent, and some of them actually did. Now, this is also beneficial for us or, or helpful for us because in this case, Jesus explains the parable so we don't have to guess what it means on our own as we're actually left to do in some cases. So let's move on to his explanation. Now, first of all, he says that the door to the sheepfold represents him. He says in verse 7, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, the sheep here clearly are God's people, those who trust in the Lord Jesus, those who are redeemed by His blood. The sheepfold into which they enter is God's kingdom. That's where the Lord gathers His sheep. Now, I don't think here that Jesus is talking about the church. I don't think He's talking about what we call the visible kingdom. But I believe He's talking about the invisible kingdom, those who have genuinely trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior because these sheep are those who enter the sheepfold through the door, which is Jesus Christ. I remember Jesus said in John 14, 6, which you've already seen in our meditation, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except or but through me. These are those who have been reconciled with the Father through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have been gathered into the invisible kingdom. And another reason why I believe the sheepfold has to be the invisible kingdom is because of something we're going to see later in this chapter 
in what Jesus actually gives to these sheep. He says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And that can only be true of those who have actually genuinely trusted in Jesus Christ who have gone through the door into the eternal kingdom of heaven. Now think about this for a minute. If Jesus is that door by which alone you can enter into the kingdom of God, where does this leave the religious leaders of Israel? Well, obviously, they are not the door. And since they themselves have not entered by this door, they are not even in God's kingdom. I mean, notice how Jesus characterizes them in his parable as those who are attempting to get into the fold in some other way than the door. This kind of reminds me of Pilgrim's Progress. Remember, there was the, the wicked gate that the pilgrims who were going to Mount Zion had to enter through, but there were those who were climbing over the wall in other places who ultimately ended up being destroyed. These were not going through the door. They were trying to get into the kingdom in their own way. Basically, you know, the religious leaders of Israel thought that by doing good works, by doing good deeds, they could get into God's kingdom. They didn't need Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, they hated him and wanted to do away with him. We don't need to believe in the Messiah. We are good enough without him. Now, if they didn't want to come through Jesus, through God's promised Messiah, which they should have if they were genuinely concerned about honoring him, why were they trying to get into the fold at all? Why were they trying to get at the sheep? Well, Jesus further ca characterizes them as those who simply wanted to take advantage of the sheep. They wanted something from them, whether it's authority, power, prestige, money. They wanted it. Now, thankfully, Jesus says the sheep avoided them because they knew these were not their master. At least that was true of those who genuinely knew the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says in verse 8, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So far from being the door into the kingdom of heaven, these religious leaders of Israel were really nothing more than thieves and robbers who were trying to take advantage of the sheep. Well, they're not the door. Jesus is the door. He is the only way into God's kingdom, not through religious leaders, not through a scheme of works, not through various kinds of religion, different forms of worship, but only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says he is the only one who can provide access to God, the only one who can reconcile us to God, the only one who provides spiritual life, the only one who can give eternal life. And he, is, he says he's the only one who can actually feed us. And that's what he's willing to do. Not the religious leaders of Israel. Now, if these men had actually followed the Lord, if they had broken the bread of life that the Lord had entrusted to them for the people of God, for the good of his people, they would have been the means by which Jesus would have pointed his people to the door. But as things stood, their ministry was destructive to the sheep. Jesus says in verses 9 and 10, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, the first question that this, you know, that what Jesus says here, the first question that it asks us is basically this, by what door are you attempting to enter into heaven? There are many, as you know, so-called doors today. There are many people who believe there are many different doors. You know, when, when Rebecca has a chance to share with us her, her trip to Thailand, I hope I'm not stealing too much of her thunder here, but one of the things that the group she was with, I think the, um, the leaders of the group, and, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but suggested that they go and speak to a Buddhist monk and ask him what he thought about how one enters into heaven. Where's the door, basically? 
Well, not surprisingly, the Buddhist monk didn't point them to Jesus because they don't believe in Jesus, although he might have seen Jesus as one possible way. Instead, he pointed to five principles, five moral principles. If you do these things, you can go to heaven. You can go to the good place. And as a matter of fact, we'll even make it easier on you. You don't have to keep all five of them. Just keep one or two of them. If you're a relatively good person, then you can get into heaven. Well, this monk believed that was the way, that was the door to enter into the good place. And he believed there were many other doors like it by which men may enter, but we do need to recognize, Jesus says here this morning, he says to you, so that you may tell others, there is only one door, and that is Jesus. Now, do you agree with Jesus on that? Do you believe that he is the one door into heaven? We, we do want to be careful now because we, we understand that, that this monk you know, may have really believed that what he was teaching was true. Maybe he really did want to help other people. And there's a lot of religious people out there who, who want to help, but you need to understand if they're not pointing to the door, they're really not helping anyone to do anything except they're cementing them in their destruction. A sincerely held deception or lie is not going to help anyone. But you know, there are so many today who really don't even have the motives perhaps of this monk or even well-meaning people who are really no different than these religious leaders of Israel who purposely want to mislead you and want to mislead other people for their own gain. They want what you have. And we know there's a lot of people out there who are trying to get your money. They want something from you. But we need to understand that the, this one who calls himself the door did not come to take anything from you. He came to give to you. He says in verse 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Do you want this life? Do you want what it is that Jesus offers to you? All you need to do is come to him. All you need to do is take hold of him by faith and receive him. All you have to do is enter through him and come to the Father. Jesus is the door. And he offers that access to you this morning. All you need to do is simply trust him. Now the interesting thing about this parable is that our Lord Jesus Christ is actually represented in more than one way. He's not only the door, he is also the shepherd. Now Jesus points out another difference between these so-called shepherds of Israel and himself. He is actually the true shepherd and he is the good shepherd. He is someone who actually cares for his sheep. Now we just saw what these pretended shepherds were doing and how they were in this only for what they could get out of it. They were not interested in sacrificing anything for the sheep, certainly not themselves. The sheep they saw merely as a tool, merely as an investment to get something they wanted. Jesus says in verses 12 and 13, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. Well, again, that was expressing exactly what the leaders of Israel were like. They didn't care about the sheep. As a matter of fact, when the leaders of Israel went through the street and they saw the common Israelite, they would often just pull in the skirts of their robe and consider those to be beneath them and unclean. They didn't care for the sheep. As a matter of fact, they would throw the sheep to the wolves if by so doing they could preserve their own lives. And in a very real sense, they would throw the sheep to the devil if they could, again, keep and hold on to what they had, which is exactly what they were doing to the people of Israel by turning them against their Messiah so that they could hold on to their influence with Rome throwing the sheep to the wolves, throwing them to the devil so that they could continue to benefit from them. But you see, our shepherd is so much different. He was not only willing to lay down his life for us, 
He actually did this. He went to the cross, far from handing us over to the devil for some benefit that he might gain from it, he went to the cross in order to save us from the devil, who even though the devil would have no power over us except for our sins and the fact that God would hand us over to judgment for our sins, Satan would gladly have taken all of us down into hell forever with himself. But our good shepherd laid down his life so that we might be spared. Jesus says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He did this so that he might save us. Now, Jesus also points out that nobody forced him to do this. This was something he did freely for us. Again, he says in verses 17 and 18, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Jesus willingly laid down his life knowing that he would, of course, be able to take it up again. But I'll tell you, it was no picnic to be nailed to a cross, to have our sins laid on him and for him to endure the wrath of God. He did that because he loves you. Jesus says that his love for you and his relationship with you is so close, it is so intimate, that he describes it as being of the same kind as that which he has with his Father. He says in verses 14 and 15, I am the good shepherd, <clears throat> and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I want you to understand that Jesus isn't saying, you know, the sheep know who I am, and I know who they are, even as the Father knows who I am, and I know who the Father is. Jesus is talking about that intimate relationship that is expressed by the word no. Remember, Adam knew his wife and she conceived. It wasn't just saying, I know who she is. Hey, hi, Eve. But in intimacy, in love, he loved her. And the Lord brought forth a child, you see. Jesus loves us and we love him in a kind of relationship that we have, that he has with his father because we have within us the Spirit whom He gave us, which is that bond of love between the Father and the Son, He has given it to us, the Spirit, who is a person, so that we might love Him and be loved by Him in the same way. Now, who else would do what Jesus did? Who else would give their life for you? Who else would or could actually stand up on the Day of Judgment on your behalf so that you might pass through judgment. There is no one else. He is the good shepherd, the only one who has given his life that he might save his sheep. Now, if you haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you may not know him in this way because this is something that is reserved for his sheep, this kind of love, this kind of relationship. But I want you to know this. Jesus cares enough about you to offer all of these blessings to you, this relationship, if you will only lay down the weapons of your warfare, stop rebelling, stop sinning against him, and receive him. Bow the knee to him as your Lord and your Savior. That is what Jesus offers to you this morning if you will only reach out and take hold of him by faith. Now, our Lord Jesus goes on to say something else that's interesting, actually two more things. He says this, if you have received him, you do need to remember, I need to remember that there is something that he wants you to do for him. Now, he's come to do a great deal for you, hasn't he? <laughs> he's come to be your door to heaven, your way of reconciliation. He came to lay down his life, to give you life, to give you abundant life, to give you spiritual food and everything you need to get to heaven. What does he want from you? Well, certainly he wants your praise, he wants your thanksgiving, he wants your love, he wants your worship. 
But there's something else that he wants you to do, and that's something that we've been seeing throughout the month of January and something that we should always keep before our eyes. He wants you to let him work through you to bring more souls home to him. Notice what Jesus says in verse 16. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Now, what was Jesus talking about here? He was actually talking about us. He was talking about those sheep that were scattered throughout the world that weren't of Israel, that were yet to be brought into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was intending to send the gospel to the Gentiles after he had finished preaching it to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember, God promised his Messiah to Israel first. And so Israel first had to, to receive the ministry of the Messiah, the offer of the Messiah. They needed to hear it first. But after they had heard it and either received it or rejected it, Jesus was sending the gospel to every nation on earth so that his kingdom might be filled. So if you have received the mercy of God, if you have received the gospel and this life, this abundant life, this eternal life, Jesus calls you to be those who share it with others. You know, Jesus said to his disciples just before he sent them out to preach and teach in the towns and villages of Palestine, freely you received, freely give. As you have received freely from the Lord, you are to offer the gospel as freely as he offered it to you to as many people as you can. And not just as many as you, as you will or you might like to, but as many people as you possibly can. Now, we're going to look a little bit more about that this evening and consider what are some of the motives? What are the things that should move us to want to do what the Lord calls us to do? Well, I hope we've already seen a few here this morning. What has Jesus done for you? That's our main motivation, isn't it? But as he has done for you, you are to do for others as many as you possibly can. Now finally, <clears throat> remember that as you do offer the gospel to others, there are going to be two responses. Some people are going to believe, but other people are not going to believe. And we see those two responses in these closing verses, in verses 19 through 21. John writes, a division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? Now again, I don't think we're surprised by the fact that there's you know, two responses to the gospel. We're certainly not surprised by the fact that when the gospel is shared, that there will be people who reject it. Jesus tells us there are going to be many. As a matter of fact, if we, if we look at the parable of the sower, we'll see proportionally more people will reject him than receive him ultimately. But on the other hand, it shouldn't surprise us that there will be some who do. After all, there is seed that by the grace of God is going to fall into the good soil. How do we know that's true? Well, just look around you. I mean, all of us who are here who have trusted Jesus, the seed fell into good soil, didn't it? I mean, there were those the Lord was intending on saving. He is able to save. He is willing to save. And that really is our confidence that as we reach out to others to tell them about Jesus, the only way to heaven, that there will be those who will be saved. And so let me encourage you this morning, don't be afraid to point others to Jesus as the door. Don't be afraid to tell them all about what the Good Shepherd does for his sheep, the one who laid down his life in order that he might save them from their sins. Jesus will use you to bring others to Christ, but there is something you have to do. You have to sow. You have to sow seed as long as you keep the gospel to yourself. 
no one is going to come to Christ. But the more people you share it with, the more people are going to come to the great shepherd. So let's, let's bow in prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us to, to again, just be encouraged to, to want to share the gospel because of what Jesus Christ has done for us and the things he continues to do for us.